I'm really happy uh, to share some personal experience uh, with this story. Um, so I guess this group don't need any uh, explanation of what JGI do. And uh, here I just want to point out that um, the degradation of the plant biomass is really the bottleneck from solar energy to biofuels. Um, so, and I'm not a biochemist, so I won't go into the detailed structure of the cell wall, but I just want to point out that the, a significant portion of the energy we can use stored in the cell wall are in this long chain of uh, cellulases. And to degrade this cellulase, we need a collaboration of three types of enzymes collectively. Uh, these three enzymes are called cellulases. So uh, their coordinate action will convert a long chain of cellulose to uh, simple sugars, which can be further fermented into biofuels. And uh, believe it uh, or not, and the uh, cellulase uses uh, in the industrial biofuel production are predominantly from one single uh, fungal species. And there are numerous efforts trying to improve this enzyme by protein engineering. But so far, um, there's no, signif uh, no significant improvement uh, on this process. So here, really, the question is, can we find um, many more cellulases, especially those different types of cellulases? And so, so that with thousands or even millions of these kind of enzymes, maybe they will enable a high throughput biochemical screen to find those novel enzymes have desirable uh, traits in both biochemically or structurally. So where do we find these enzymes? We know there are quite a few biomass degradation communities and the microbes um, in these animals or or, or birds or insects, they can convert biomass very efficiently. And the GIGI, and you probably uh, already hear um, uh, some of them, uh, like uh, the, sh yeah, the shipworm, uh, is, that doesn't look like but the shipworm is, is one of them. And also uh, we have uh, worked with the termites and the wallaby um, papers already published. But here today, I'm going to uh, tell the story of the cow. So, uh, why the cow? So uh, here is probably the most critical player of the team, uh, the big Betty, uh, right here. Sorry, I didn't show his, uh, her face. Um, so with this happy cow has a unique, uh, that make, um, make it stand out. So uh, to his room, there's a door. And uh, we call this cow a fisted cow. So through the door, you can actually stick your arm into the room and grab whatever in it. Or this is also the door that leads to the microbes in the room. So uh, with this, it's very convenient. So for, for whatever we are interested, we can put uh, the biomass into uh, the room of the cow. And uh, while the micro work on the uh, biomass, we can pull them out. So in this study, uh, we, we chose switchgrass uh, for reasons that everybody knows. And uh, when we put uh, switchgrass into the rooming, uh, three days later, we see significant degradation. So 35% uh, re reductions in cellulose and lignin. So, uh, and we can even see the microbes that are actually work on the uh, fibers here. So here is the human picture shows uh, two type of um, microbes that you know, work on the cellulose fiber here. So from the fibers, we can pull the microbes out and harvest their DNA and determine what's in there. So we constructed uh, quite a few libraries. Uh, some of them are short, uh, 200 bits per insert, and some of them are long, uh, 3KB and 5KB, to assist the gene genome assembly. We use both uh, the Illumina G2 platform and uh, also the HiSeq. And in total, we have 270 gigabits of sequence. Um, of course, uh, to this audience, this number does not seem to 
be so dramatic anymore, in the, <laughs> but still we have 3 billion reads. Um, so this is part still true, that's part of the largest uh, data set ever from a single uh, sample. So compared to two previous studies, like uh, in the term of uh, gut and in the wallaby, and the amount of data we get simply dwarf um, the other two studies. And of course, analyzing this data is a different story. So to, to us, you know, it's really a monster jumping at us. So um, in the next, um, uh, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, this, I, I, I would not say struggle, this really, you know, these two short uh, trips during our journey trying to tame uh, this data beast. So I'm going to talk about the prediction and the validation of the enzymes. Uh, that's what we uh, hope to get. And also, I want in the second part of the talk, I'm talking about a little bit about the genome assembly. So we we'll start with the first. So to tame this monster, we better to have some powerful uh, sword. So here's our sword. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail the hardware aspects of the hardware infrastructure. So I'm going to just, uh, so the take home message for this is we're trying to build a system with large memory because at some point we need to see the data uh, all at once. And also since we're going to read and write large amount of data, so this system will have very uh, fast speed in read and write the data or high performance I.O. So with this hardware, and also we need some software because uh, this is really the first time we have to deal with this, and uh, there's no uh, existing algorithm to finish our job, so we have to work on our own. And again, I won't go into details of this, but there's four major steps. We first, we pre-process the reads to improve uh, the quality uh, of this short read data, and then we'll feed this to a, uh, a De Bruyne graph based uh, short read assembler, Vavit. And then um, we use IMG gene prediction pipeline to, break, uh, to predict genes. And the predict gene, uh, we will use uh, HMM-based approach to search for the cellular signatures. And at the end of the pipeline, from the raw reads, we'll get our candidate cellulase. Okay. So with this amount of data, we do get a lot of cellulases. So just take one of the uh, type of these uh, cellulases compared to two, uh, the two previous study, we got uh, more than 2,000 endoglucanases. Um, and another thing I need to point out, and among these 2,000 genes, about half of them are full length. And this is in contrast to previous study, they only get gene fragments. So with these uh, genes, so we want to synthesize these genes for biochemical study, or we want to do a protein uh, omics. So this would make that possible. So I guess um, uh, Dan earlier uh, in the day talked about the KZ, uh, so which is an online database that uh, record uh, over 30, uh, uh, 35 years of study uh, in this uh, uh, carbohydrate active enzymes. So compared to uh, all the studies combined, in this single study, we found similar numbers of enzymes uh, from all these three categories. So we are not rediscover something already known, and among the new discoveries, only 1% has been seen before. So I mentioned we want to find those novel enzymes. So if we look at this phylogenetic tree built from the existing KZ enzymes, and we overlay the new genes we found in rumen, and we find you know, they are really, you know, uh, the diversity covers the entire spectrum of the tree. And if we zoom into one of the branch, and we see not only uh, we found a lot of new members of existing group, there's also a uh, new branch form suggests we may have found a new subfamily um, of this uh, enzyme family. So to summarize um, uh, this part, 
from this deep sequence metagenome from the cow, uh, we predict many full-length cellulose genes, and many of them are novel. So you may be asking uh, already, so are these genes real? You know, we, we do see most of them are indeed expressed uh, from the metatranscription study, which I don't show here. But what we really care are these new enzymes have activity. So to test this, uh, we pick a small set of the predicted genes. We pick 90 of them. We PCR them out from the original metagenome sample. And then we express them and test their activity on a panel of common cellulose, uh, uh, cellulose substrate. Uh, and you point out this includes the two energy uh, crops, the switchgrass and the miscanthus. So, um, so when we see um, the candidates are active in at least one of the substrate, we'll call this enzyme active. Using this standard, we found about 57% of the predicted cellulases, um, we expect them to have activity uh, at least on one substrate. Okay, so and we also care about we we want to find those novel active ones. So here uh, is the the another illustration of the same result. So on the x-axis we show how similar these cellulases uh, against these known ones. So that's the, uh, the sequence identity. So the, the smaller the number, the more diverse of these enzymes. And we're really happy to see a lot of the enzymes that have uh, little uh, similarity to known ones are indeed active. So we have hoped with deep sequencing, we can capture all the cellulose encoded by the rumen microbiome. So the question is, have we done that? Or in other words, have we reached the bottom? Um, so uh, I know in the human microbiome study, they claim they reached the bottom because they don't see new protein families. But here, we really care about you know, genes. And so we did a plot on the x axis is the sequence depth. On the y axis is the number of genes predicted. And from the data we have, and we can see the trend is pretty linear. So in other words, are there more enzymes uh, in the rumen? And the answer is definitely yes. And uh, how many more sequences will need to reach the bottom uh, from this data, we don't know. So uh, to summarize the enzyme discovery part, so we found a lot of the cellulose candidates and many of them are full length, novel, and have activity. I want to stress on that, this represents a generic approach uh, for new enzyme uh, discovery. So any of you can uh, use the same approach or you can come to the same data to find your favorite enzymes. You know, here I'm just showing, you know, uh, even a little girl can find something from the room. Uh, of course, uh, she will find candy. I, oh, I think she, She's holding the cards, probably everybody of you have a copy. But, you know, the, re, uh, the real challenge would be, you know, how we, we use this information to improve the biofuel production. Uh, uh, or, you know, can we engineer this enzyme into crops? So upon induction, uh, they will start to work on the biomass. So I will leave this uh, challenge task to our energy research colleagues. So now I'm going to switch gear, talking about the second part of the story, uh, the genome assembly. So we all know another challenge working with um, microbiome is very few of them, we can culture them in the lab. So if we rather than pick 100 cells from the rumen um, microbiome and only one of them, we accept them, they will grow. So, but we do need the full, uh, the full genome sequence so we can better understand their metabolic capacity and also the pathway involved in biomass degradation. So the question is, is genome assembly possible from a complex community? So we, we know from sample um, 
committee like the, uh, the, the, the acid mine drainage, uh, which has five species and two, uh, two of them, I believe, are dominant one. And uh, from uh, an uh, early study, we do assemble uh, two of the, uh, I think three of the genomes from this study. And on the other end of those um, extremely complex samples, like the soil, uh, Jim just told you, and uh, we, we also did some early, early studies uh, uh, back in two, two, 2005, and we know the answer is probably no, at least with, um, uh, as Jim pointed out, you probably you need tens of terabits of sequence to be able to do that. So the question here, with cow, uh, has a medium uh, com uh, complexities, uh, has about a thousand species, um, and with this sequence depth, can we assemble the genomes? So we, uh, we feed the 250 gigabits of sequence to um, the velvet assembler, and uh, five days later, we do have some assemblies, and some of them are pretty large. There's eight large scaffold over one megabase. We know an average size of the microbial genome is three to five megabase. So we are, should be very hopeful that, you know, maybe from this scaffold we can form genome assemblies. So, and I want to point out in this room, as I said, when we check whether we see something we already seen before. So at the nucleotide level, uh, similarity, very few of the scaffold can be mapped to the NCBI database. So in, in other words, most of the species, we have no idea. So we won't be able to align the reads to any of the, the reference available. So we have been told not to jump off the cliff without a parachute, but in this way we have to. Um, but we are not com completely clueless because the data itself contains some clues uh, to help us uh, assemble the data. So for, for example, we can use the current consistency because we do expect the, um, the uh, scaffold uh, from, you know, the genome, they will have similar coverage. And here is a good example, and that's probably a bad one. And we also can look at the mate pairs and to, to uh, di distinguish the correct assemblies versus the wrong one. So most of the scaffold, uh, based on the size, is probably uh, those pieces of whole genome. So again, from the coverage information, we can group uh, these pieces into groups because the pieces from the same genome are expected to have similar coverage. Of course, during this step, we'll make mistakes, like in this case, two different genomes and similar coverage will be grouped together by this step. So there are other clues. So it turned out that different microbial genomes, they have different signatures. So in this case, we look at the unique tetranucleotide frequency signature. And based on the sequenced genome, we know from this signature, we can reliably tell different genomes apart. So we then apply this criteria to the bands um, we form in above. And hopefully, in these genome bands we form, uh, they are um, likely from the same genome. So at the end of the day, uh, we have more than 400 genome bands formed. But the question is, are these genome bands represent real draft genomes? And especially, we want to check two criteria. The first one, we want to check the completeness because we wish this draft genome, uh, the they include as many as possible the fragments from the same genome. And we want to make sure we don't include um, pieces from other genomes, uh, so that we need to check the heterogeneity. So how do we do that? So from the sequenced genome, we can actually get some clue about these two criteria. 
So for example, if we take a, uh, the genomes uh, from the same uh, genus and we catalog the genes uh, from this sequence genome, we can find a core gene set that's shared by all the uh, sequence genome in the same genus. So when we have a new draft genome, we can ask how many of the core genes it contains. That gives us an estimation of how complete our genome assembly is. And also, a subset of these core genes, they normally appear only as single copy genes uh, in the sequence genome. So if we have two single copy genes in our draft genome assembly, that indicates a problem. So from this, we can estimate the, he the heterogeneity of our genome assemblies. So here, I just want to show you a good example of our genome assemblies. So in this particular genome bank, we call it AGA. It belongs to the genus of Bacteroides. It has a three megabase uh, genome formed uh, by these, uh, uh, I think, around 30 scaffold. And when we look at the core genes, um, almost 90% of them are there. So that gives us an estimate um, that this genome assembly is about 90% complete. And then when we look at the conserved single copy genes, and the number is very low, suggest probably the, uh, the, there are a few errors uh, in the genome assembly. So this is in contrast. So when we just randomly bang the scaffold to form a similar size of genome bang, and in this case, the two numbers are much worse. So we have a pretty good feel uh, how to tell good assembly and bad assembly. So we apply these two criteria and to those more than 400 genome bands. And at the end, we picked uh, 15 uh, genome bands. We, we call them good draft genomes. Uh, their size ranges from 1.8 to 3.3 megabase. And uh, completeness range from 6% to 93%. And all of them have less than 5% uh, duplicate single uh, copy genes. So there's still a problem. So for those genomes are very closely related and this criteria will fail. So how can we tell that? So I think informatics probably can only take us that far. So in this case, we, uh, uh, we collaborate with a tennis group. Uh, so in, uh, in this experiment, we pick a single cell at a time from this fiber attached rumen microbial community. And we sort them and then amplify the single cells and sequence the amplified uh, genome. So, and again, this is the example I sh showed before. When we aligned the reads from single cell uh, genome sequencing and every scaffold from this genome bank are hit by this single genome reads. This, this strongly suggests all the scaffold are indeed from a single uh, cell or a single organism. So to conclude, uh, using ultra-deep metagenome sequencing, even with short reads technology, we're likely um, this can become a standard way to identify gene genomes uh, from on um, complex communities with many un uncultured organisms. So I have to stress on this is still a research in progress because we, have, we haven't uh, have time to optimize any of the steps I showed you uh, yet. Uh, but we are look, actually looking at now ways to further improve this um, process. And uh, in the rest um, uh, two minutes, let me talk about some uh, uh, very preliminary data uh, using uh, the PacBio uh, uh, platform. As you probably have learned from Lane's talk yesterday, so this new uh, uh, platform will give us very long reads. So in collaboration uh, with the uh, PacBio company, uh, we get about um, 150,000 reads and total uh, 80 megabits. And uh, that's this graph shows the length of the read, uh, the, the, the distribution of the read length. So you, you know, we, we can see uh, maybe 
um, but better in this, uh, a lot of them are quite long. So here, only show those reads are 4 kb or longer. And uh, our champ, I think, is uh, over 7 kb. So the, the question is, can we use these long reads to further improve the assembly process? And we are still working on the data, but I, I think the, the answer is probably yes. So first of all, we checked, since these long reads, uh, it has the connectivity. So we're so glad that you know, almost 90% of these long reads actually confirms our assemblies. Both uh, the assembly have uh, correct uh, context in it and in the right order. And for the remaining 10%, we found these long reads are particularly useful to do one of these three things. It can help us to join two scaffolds and should belong to the same one, and also help us to resolve repeats. And some, in some cases, the long reads also indicate there's a misassembly that should be detangled. So um, that's Basically, what I, uh, that's my story, and here is uh, the Roman team. Um, I have to say it's, uh, it's a terrific team to work with. It's a, a lot of fun, and uh, this team is, is led by uh, uh, Dr. Rubin, and uh, the majority of the informatics work are done by these two individuals, Alex and Rob, and uh, Matthias and Info and Tao and Fang, they are responsible for the um, library and the experiment, and we got a lot of help uh, from the scientists at DGI. And uh, this uh, is a collaboration between, um, uh, with uh, Elomin and Pankbao uh, companies, and also uh, the cow is actually at Illinois, and, uh, and, uh, and that group in EBI helped with the, in, uh, the, the enzyme testing, and this um, and I have to mention that you know the, the hardware infrastructure is helped um, by a German brand, and this work is uh, funded by you know, JGI and DOE and EBI and NERSC. So I think I want to end with this because, as I said, we probably just you know scratch the surface of the data. It's, it's a, a lot of data that probably a lot of. Uh, discoveries can be made from the same data. So as you know, everybody at the GRGI are trying to do, we made the data public available. So it's on our own FTP site. It's available on the short read archive. Of course, um, uh, it's probably not there anymore. That's what I heard. But the data is also available on Amazon. So you, for, for those of you who are interested to analyze this data, you don't have to download anything. The data is already there. I think I will stop here, and thanks for your attention. Are there any questions? <clears throat> it's not fair for me to ask questions, because I was a semi-part of the study. Two questions. One, I missed how you got the core genome. And the second thing, uh, it depends on what the cow was fed, too. So in, in terms of what cellulases and what populations were selected. So was that a consideration in this goal? So I, I think I, I, I can ask you the first question. Uh, so for, to form the core uh, gene set, uh, so we basically will, if for example, we take all the, uh, I think we take 10, at least 10 sequence genome from the same. Okay. Then, then I understand. Yeah, genomes. Yeah. And for your third question, do you, does it ask? The, I mean, what the cow was fed makes a big difference on what is selected in the, in the rumen. Yeah, I'm not quite sure. I can answer that one. We put in a nylon bag and we fibers from switchgrass, and then we removed the nylon band with the fibers from switchgrass, and we took the microbes that became adherent. And so there was a, and we did this from two different cows, and we showed it really wasn't dependent upon the cow, it was really the fibers, the switchgrass that brought a unique community to it. And so there cl clearly the cow could have had a different complexity of microbes, and so, but it, but it suggested that the substrate was really selecting for 
the community and not what the cow is being fed, the substrate that we had introduced through the rumen. Yeah, so we, yeah. we did this only in one cow. I think with this reference, then it makes it easier to go as many cows sure. as possible. Yeah. So right? it was like a bait. Right. I mean, yeah. it was yeah. a bait. Yeah. But yeah. That's right. But, you, but the pond you sampled right. in was that's limited. True. That's true. That's because true. it could have been a fed a woody substrate right. and the bait would have right. gotten something else. Yeah. But the other part is they put miscanthus into two different cows and the miscanthus uh, microbe population was very different from the switchgrass. But you're right, you're, whatever you start with is what you're going to be selecting with it. Okay. Anything else? Well, I, I want to thank everybody for coming to the meeting. I think the, we've, we've been talking internally and the quality of the speakers has been as best as we've ever had. I think the attendance and turnout has been highest that we've ever had and so we're really happy to have you all here. Um, I'm sure we'll be doing this again next year and it seems like Eddie has a few comments. No, this is an evolving meeting and the JGI is evolving and the way we evolve in the right direction is the input we get from the users and so I urge people to send us, you know, you each got emailed a questionnaire about the meeting but we're quite interested in things you like, things you didn't like, directions you'd like to go for the JGI meeting to go as well as directions you'd like to see the, the JGI go. And so with that, I want to thank you for coming and have a good safe trip home.